Okay, good morning everyone. Let's uh, get started. So for the undergraduates, let's take a deep breath. Congratulations. Hopefully you've made it to the end of all 10 assignments. Yes? Okay, congratulations. Take a moment because in 30 seconds we're going to dive into the final project. So between now and 30 seconds from now, you have no homework assigned. You've finished assignment 10. Okay. All right. So let's just pause for a moment to see where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. You finished all 10 assignments. You've made your way through, not to the end, I'm sorry to say, but to the end of the beginning. You now have a code base in which you have a very, very simple AI method, which is able to optimize the behavior for a very simple robot in a very simu uh, simple simulated world with a very simple body and a very simple neural network controller, a minimal complement of sensors and motors. So minimal, 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 but We've got all the pieces uh, in place. We're going to talk about what's expected for the final project for the undergraduates uh, in a moment. Basic idea, take one or more of those components and enrich it, expand it, exaggerate it in some way to get your robot to do something a little bit more interesting than walk from the origin in order to maximize the X component of its final position. Yeah? Okay. Any questions about the assignments? Anything that's not clear? Okay, let's talk about uh, the final project. You will see on row 41 here uh, for today, for the undergraduates in column J now, uh, there is a pointer to milestone one. If you click on that, it'll take you through, uh, it'll take you through to Blackboard, um, and you will see that your first milestone is due this coming Monday at 11.59 p.m. This coming Monday at 11.59 p.m. as usual. So you're going to be continuing to submit images and videos every Monday night demonstrating to us now that you're making progress towards your final project. Yeah? Okay. Uh, you will see that there's a link to the instructions about what exactly you're supposed to be doing. What I would suggest is uh, today and at the latest tomorrow to read through this document from stem to stern. It's not that long. It's a little over one page. I'm just going to go through it very quickly now so you have a basic idea of what's expected uh, for you. For the undergraduates, uh, you can choose a project that's already kind of described uh, for you. So if you click through to the link at the top of this, this will take you back to the Ludobots uh, subreddit. And this is taking you to uh, learning module O here, the final project. And in the final project, you will find a long list of project ideas. Each one is labeled with uh, easy or hard. You can choose a project from this list for example, uh, pronking, just for fun. Um, uh, some of you may remember the old Looney Tunes cartoon with Pepe Le Pew, the skunk. No, no, I'm showing my age. Okay, I see a couple people nodding, that's good. So various animals pronk, it's a particular quadrupedal gait, which we didn't talk about. We talked about legged locomotion, where all four feet hit the ground at the same time, and then all four feet leave the ground at the same time. That's uh, pronking. Um, so instead of evolving your robot to maximize displacement, can you evolve it to maximize displacement to move as far as possible, but to move in a particular way, to move with a given, with a particular kind of gait? Think about that particular project for a moment and think about, hopefully, you have at least the broad outlines in your head now of all the moving pieces in your code base. Where would you need to make some changes in order to evolve a robot that displaces and prompts? Ideas? In the fitness function. For sure, you're going to need to make some change in the fitness function. You may, depending on how you implement the pronking project, if you were to choose it, that might be the only thing you need to change. Maybe not, right? OK. Uh, you'll see a long list of them. I'm not going to read through them. A lot of them have sort of cutesy, tongue-in-cheek names. Uh, you can have a look through. 
have a read through to get to get an idea of sort of what's possible. So uh, for the undergraduates, you've got five weeks left uh, in the semester. The easy and the hard projects are, are probably reasonable for the five weeks that we have left. Um, you can also uh, devise a final project of your own, and you heard me uh, mention this to the graduate students already. Be sure, if you want to tackle your own project, talk to Krishna or myself and make sure that we just sign off on it, that we sort of can agree with you that it's something that's doable in about uh, five weeks. Yeah? Okay. Um, whatever you come up with, if you come up with an idea of your own, uh, it must involve modifying the code base in some way. So a final project in which you throw away all the hard work you've done in the last 10 weeks and start something from scratch, not, not appropriate for this course. Now we want to use uh, all the work that you've done up to this point to leverage uh, some sort of interesting project about evolving robot behavior. All good? Seem reasonable? Okay. All right. Okay, uh, as, as I mentioned, we have five uh, Mondays remaining in the semester. You're going to use this time to devise, implement, and incrementally, and implement incrementally your final project. Um, if you found the 10 programming assignments uh, a bit of a struggle or a bit of a challenge, I would advise you to pick one of the easy projects. Uh, if you found the assignments uh, relatively straightforward and a breeze, uh, go ahead and choose something from the hard uh, category. You will not be penalized for choosing an easy uh, project. It's up to you. So you tried to sort of pick something that's that it, it's everybody's speed. Um, if you want to try an idea of your own, email uh, me or the TA or, or come see us at office hours and just make sure we sign off on it. Okay. All right. I want you uh, this week, uh, read through those projects, think about ideas of your own. And then think about how you would break it down into three weekly deliverables. And again, we already talked about uh, this. As you can imagine, you're going to be submitting over the next three Mondays uh, images or video proof to us that you've implemented that baby step towards your final project. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so write out, uh, write out uh, your idea of what you want to do or just to pick one from the list and then write out each of those three milestones and the visualizations you can imagine that if you were to implement that milestone and generate those images or video and submit that to us, it would convince us that you've completed your uh, weekly milestone. So far so good? Make sense? Okay, uh, so by next Monday, what are you going to be submitting? You're going to be completing the housekeeping section uh, in the final project. So I'll jump back to uh, the subreddit here. You'll see there's this long list of projects, but at the top, there's a short section on housekeeping. There's a little bit, uh, there's little bits of the underlying code that's a little bit clunky, which I didn't have a chance to clean up before the class started. So you're all going to clean it up. It's pretty straightforward. It's all very mechanical. Just implement these little patches and fixes. You don't need to submit any videos or images that you've completed this step. Just make sure you clean up these, uh, these steps before you uh, move on to a final project. OK, so finish up. Uh, do the housekeeping first, and then, uh, and then complete whatever your first milestone is by next Monday, and you will now find in Blackboard, in Course Materials, final project, there's a milestone uh, underscore undergrad. Please make sure, you'll see there's actually two submissions in there, milestone 01 for the grad students and milestone 01 for the undergrads. Please make sure you submit to the right place. You, uh, in your Blackboard submission, you can copy and paste your, your sentences describing what your selected project is or just Tell us what it is, short description of what your three milestones are, and submit links to uh, the images or video proof of completion of milestone one. So Krishna or myself, when we're grading your first milestone, we will look at your submission, read what your project is, read your three milestones to make sure they're reasonable, and then we'll check your images and video to see that you actually proved to us that you implemented the first milestone. Straightforward. The week after, the Monday after that, uh, submit your second milestone. The week after that, submit your third milestone. Okay. All right. The Monday after that, four Mondays uh, from now, April 24th, uh, you're, you're going to be showing us preliminary results from your A-B test. So going back to the subreddit for a moment, 
uh, after the final project. Oh, I forgot to mention, there's a little bit of tips and tricks. So depending on which project you decide to implement, there may be various aspects of PyroSim, the simulator that you need to change that we haven't talked about in this course so far. So go and read through tips and tricks as well. I'll put a note about that in the final project document. That uh, can be very helpful depending on which final project you're submitting. The final, uh, the very final learning module in Ludobots is a description of what A-B testing is. What is A-B testing? This is probably the most common approach uh, in engineering and also software engineering, user interface design. You create two versions of your website, your machine, your product, your service, whatever it is, and you deploy version A and B to your alpha testers, and they prefer B over A, so B becomes your final product or service. Yeah? You don't necessarily need a set of alpha testers to do uh, uh, A-B testing. You're going to sort of do it yourself. So going back to the example of pronking, let's assume that you've chosen the pronking final project. You evolve uh, your robot for a couple hours. You evolve your robot for eight hours overnight on your laptop. And every morning, you get something that vaguely looks like pronking, but it's still not great. Your evolutionary algorithm seems to be struggling to produce pronking. You come up with a new idea, which is maybe I can change the evolutionary algorithm in this way to make it a stronger search method so that it's less likely to get stuck in local optima of the fitness landscape. It's less likely to get stuck with an okay but not great solution. You spend week four be between submitting the third deliverable and submitting preliminary results from your A-B test with de developing variant B of your code. You're still evolving for pronking, but you replace or modify the evolutionary algorithm with a more high-powered evolutionary algorithm. And you now are asking yourself the question, does that new evolutionary algorithm facilitate the evolution of pronking? Does it make it easier to evolve whatever desired behavior you want? How are you going to prove to yourself, and eventually to Krishna and myself, that that is true, that B is actually better than A. That your evolutionary algorithm B is doing a better job of evolving pronking than A. Ideas? Like take the view and just show the uh, comparison and the output? That would be great. That's perfectly fine for preliminary results. So you submit uh, April 24th. Uh, Josh and Krishna, I ripped out the parallel hill climber and I put in this other evolutionary algorithm and here's a video of the best pronking I got from this other, with this other evolutionary algorithm. Yeah? Okay. Are you convinced that whatever that new evolutionary algorithm is, is actually better at producing pronking? Even if the pronking in this preliminary video is better than the pronking we saw from you in the previous three weeks. Then you can say you might have just gotten lucky in the previous report. You might have just gotten lucky, right? So you create two versions of a website, A and B, and you show it to one alpha tester. Alpha tester, one, uh, your single alpha tester loves uh, user interface B and hates user interface A, right? Okay, great, obvious, we're done. Let's go with, let's roll out version B to millions of our actual users, right? It's not enough data to do one run with evolutionary algorithm B and one run with evolutionary algorithm A and B happens to get uh, better pronking than A, yeah? It's preliminary evidence and that's all we're looking for by the fourth Monday, that's perfectly fine. Here's what we implemented, here's a video. It doesn't even have to be better. It might be that pronking is worse with B. We're not looking for you eventually to prove to us that variant B, your variant B is better than your variant A. We'll get to that. So far so good? Okay, between that, uh, between that, uh, between that last Monday during the semester and Two Mon Mondays after that, which is the night before our exam period, you're submitting a written report 
and a YouTube video, which you'll use for your oral presentation. We'll talk about this. You're submitting two things the night before your exam period. And in that written report and that oral presentation, you're going to show us full results from your A-B test. And you're going to try and prove to us that either B is better than A, evolutionary algorithm B produces better pronking than evolutionary algorithm A, or it actually made things worse. You swapped in a new evolutionary algorithm thinking it would be better, and for whatever reason, it's actually worse. That's, that's fine too. What we're not looking for in your final, final project that you'll be presenting to us orally during the exam period is, I did A and B, and sometimes A is okay, sometimes B is okay, I don't really know whether one is better than the other. That's an unsuccessful A-B test. Yeah. Okay. What kind of evidence do you think you could accumulate between April 24th and May 8th to convince yourself and then convince Krishna, myself, and the rest of your fellow students here about the results of your A-B test? What data would you collect during that two-week period? A bunch of uh, solution objects that you can compare to each other. A bunch of solution objects uh, for both, right? Solution objects for A and solution objects for B, where are these multiple solution objects coming from? How are you going to collect multiple solution objects? By simulating them. By simulating them? Can we be more specific? I run my parallel hill climber and get a, a neural network that produces kind of OK pronking. That's one solution object. I need more. Where do I get more from? Sorry? Run it again, right? Remember, an evolutionary algorithm is a stochastic algorithm. So if you run it again, you're going to start with another initial random population of neural networks. And if you run it again, you're going to get a different neural network that produces pronking again, maybe better, maybe, maybe worse. So what most students do, and we can come back and talk about this on April 24th, is over this two-week period, overnight on your laptop, you do one run of A which gives you a fitness curve and a video of the best solution from that run. The next night, overnight, you run variant B of your code, which gives you another fitness curve and another version of pronking. Third night, you run A again, then B, then A, then B, then A. And if you don't kill your laptop and your code doesn't crash in a two-week period, you're going to have seven versions of A and seven versions of B. We'll talk about doing statistical tests, but for now, the more data you have from A and from B, the better chance you're gonna have to prove to yourself and to us, A is better than B or B is better than A at producing whatever desired behavior you want. Make sense? Okay. The example I gave you about pronking and evolutionary algorithm A and B, it could be something else. A and B don't have to be different evolutionary algorithms. You could keep the same evolutionary algorithm and make neural network A and neural network B. Does pronking, can you evolve better pronking if the robot is controlled by a neural network with hidden neurons or not? Right? We just saw last week an example of an experiment where they did exactly that. They literally had neural networks called A, B, C, D and E, right? There's different ways you can make changes to your code. Maybe you have fitness function A, fitness function B. You're making slight variants of your code and comparing them. Yeah. One, uh, I, I know this is we're getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves because we haven't got to A/B testing yet. But just to put this in the back of your mind, when you do A/B testing, change one thing. Don't make evolutionary algorithm A and evolutionary algorithm B, and also neural network A and neural network B. Because if you do see a difference, what caused it? If B is better than A, was it because the robots were equipped with B neural network? Or was it because they were evolved with evolutionary algorithm B? Yeah, change, pick one thing and change just that one thing. Okay, and then we'll talk about what you're actually submitting and presenting during the, uh, the exam period. Any questions about all that? Okay. Off you go. Very excited to see what you all come up with. OK, back to uh, our lecture material. Uh, we're a little bit behind. 
We're here. We're still on neat and hyper neat, but we'll finish up the, the hyper neat uh, lecture in a moment. Lecture 15 is very short. We'll start it and finish it today. And then we will start in probably today on the Golem project. OK, uh, back to neat and hyper neat. Uh, just to remind you, these are two different algorithms. Neat was designed to solve a particular problem, the competing conventions problem. It also gives us this nice property that if we're evolving populations of neural networks, it allows the evolutionary algorithm to cut these neural networks in parts and glue those parts together in a form of sexual recombination. And sometimes it does so and it produces child neural networks that have higher fitness than either parent alone. We can mix and match and that also allows these evolving populations of neural networks. It allows evolution to alter their cognitive architecture, to change the number of neurons and the wiring diagram among those neurons over evolutionary time. We started, uh, we introduced HyperNeat last time, which as the name implies, is an evolutionary algorithm that uses NEAT as a starting point. So in HyperNeat, we're still evolving uh, populations of neural networks. But these neural networks are very different from neural networks we've seen so far. They are neural networks that take as input, not sensor values or not images. They take as input coordinates or locations. And they generate something that should be placed at that position in space and or time. So you can think of the hyper-neat algorithm as producing networks that paint regular patterns inside a hypercube, inside some space of arbitrary dimension. Yeah? The dimensionality of that hypercube is determined by the dimension of the input coordinates. So if we want to paint a pretty picture in, uh, two, in two dimensions, we have x and y. If we want to paint an image in three dimensions, we have x, y, z. If we want to paint uh, an image in a cube that changes over time, then we need x, y, z, t, uh, x, y, z, and t, and so on. Yeah, so far so good? Okay. So we looked at HyperNeat and the types of networks that they evolve, which are called uh, CPPNs, or Compositional Pattern Producing Networks. So I just wanted to come back to CPPNs for a moment. We talked about the fact that they're networks, they're neural networks. We saw last time how CPPNs produce patterns. What about the compositional part? Why, why are they compositional? Let's test your recall of CPPNs, how they work. What is it that they're composing here? If you, it's like the same thing as like the diagram on the left, where it's just like the whole neural network is basically a composition of different um, like activation functions. Absolutely. It's a composition of activation functions. So I don't remember now if this was high school algebra or first year algebra. The composition of functions, you can take a function of a function, right? Comp uh, function composition. Same thing here. If we take x and y and we push it through one activation function, the result of that transformation gets passed to a another function. Yeah. So among other things, what CPPNs are doing is composing functions together. Those functions are acting on coordinate values. We're feeding as input. Uh, coordinates. So these functions are actually coordinate transforms. They're taking a whole bunch of positions and transforming those positions. So strictly speaking, a CPPN is composing coordinate transforms. It doesn't really matter too much for our purposes, but just to make clear exactly what CPPNs are doing. They transform coordinates and then generate and deposit something at all of those locations. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> well, what does this have to do with evolutionary robotics? We mentioned last time that uh, when we look out in nature, we see a lot of modularity. When we look out in nature, we also see a lot of regularity. Like this cartoon insect here, we are also bilaterally symmetric. 
Most of the left side of our body is the same as, our right, as the right side of our body, at least on the outside, not on the inside. You also see in nature repetition of things. Once Mother Nature invents something like a leaf, whatever that leaf does for the tree, generally speaking, it's better to have more of them. Once Mother Nature invented this thing, it was better to have more of them. Yeah? So there's good reasons to discover modules and then repeat them or spread them out over space uh, and time in organisms. And as we're going to see in a moment, we can ask the question, is that also useful for machines? Yeah? And you can guess we wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't useful for machines. Yeah? Okay, so we're gonna look now at this, uh, the reading for this lecture was taken from uh, this 2009 paper. It takes a little bit to wrap your mind around about what's going on here. Um, at heart, what you're gonna see in this experiment is not that different from anything we've seen before. These uh, investigators are gonna use an evolutionary algorithm to evolve coordinated gates for a quadrupedal or four-legged robots. So same goal that basically you have in assignment 10, evolve a four-legged robot to move as far as possible in a simulated world in a fixed period of time. Yeah? The twist here is that they're gonna use HyperNeat to do it. They're not gonna use a parallel hill climber. They're not gonna use a genetic algorithm. They're using this specific evolutionary algorithm to do so. How do, you, how do you put these two things together? How do you take evolutionary robotics and combine it with CPPNs? There's different ways you can imagine doing it. Here's the way that the investigators came up with doing it. They're not gonna evolve the body of their robot. They're fixing the body of their robot. They're picking a quadrupedal body, uh, body plan with so many uh, links, so many joints, so many sensors, so many motors. They're making all of those decisions. They are also fixing the cognitive architecture of the neural network controller. They are picking how many sensor neurons there are, how many hidden neurons there are, and how many motor neurons there are. So they're choosing most, most everything here. They're gonna allow HyperNeat to generate the synaptic weights that connect the sensor neurons to the hidden neurons and that connect the hidden neurons to the motor neurons. So this should seem very, very familiar. Yeah. The only twist here is they're evolving CPPNs that are gonna paint weights onto these synapses. Yeah. So in your code base, you're evolving the synaptic weights of your robot's neural controller. In their case, they're evolving populations of CPPNs where each CPPN in the population paints weights onto a second, completely different neural network, and it's this second neural network that actually controls the robot. Take that painted neural controller, drop it into the simulated robot, see how well the simulated robot does in the simulated world, and whatever fitness value you get, you tag the CPPN that generated this neural network controller with that fitness value. We'll go into the details of how exactly they did this, but everybody see that? So this is the twist here. There's actually two different neural networks. One is basically generating the other one. Seems strange. Why? Why do this? It seems unnecessarily complicated. Why not just evolve, if you're gonna evolve behavior, why not just evolve the synaptic weights directly? Have any of you actually looked at the sets of synaptic weights that evolve for your quadruped, Mel? What, what regular patterns do you see among those synaptic weights? None, None whatsoever, right? Whatever, whatever locomotion strategy you're getting or you're evolving for your quadruped, I'm gonna guess it belongs in the Ministry of Silly Walks, right? You might get some oscillation, but for most of us, you get sort of these odd hiccups and these strange ways of moving. Yeah? So the gait you're getting is usually not regular. If you evolved it on your laptop for a few weeks or a few months, your parallel hill climber might, might 
be able to iron out some of those kinks and get a smooth oscillatory regular gait. But it takes huge, typically takes huge evolutionary effort to do so if you're evolving the weights directly. Okay, let's have a look at the synaptic weights in this experiment. You'll notice from this cartoon picture over here, the first thing they do is take the neural controller for their robot and they embed it in a three-dimensional space. If we think about this as the x-axis and this as the y-axis and this as the z-axis, you'll see that at z equals zero, they've placed all the sensor neurons, and at z equals one, they placed all of the hidden neurons, and at z equals two, they've placed all of the motor neurons. So all of the neural network, all of the neural controllers we've seen in this course so far, they had no geometric interpretation. They didn't really ex ex uh, exist in a spatial embedding. Now this one does, yeah? Okay. Uh, so let's go back to z equals zero. Here we have the one, two, three, four times one, two, three, four, the 16 sensor neurons inside uh, this robot. Uh, let me jump ahead to a picture of this quadruped. Here's the quadruped here. Looks similar to, but not quite the same as your quadruped. Four legs, we have, for each of those legs, we have a hip and a knee, so we have a total of eight joints which is the same as your quadruped. So we've got hip, forward, and back. Uh, sorry, there's 12 joints in this quadruped. Hip, forward, and back. Hip, in, and out. And knee, forward, and back. Yeah, so three joints for each of the four legs. Let's take uh, the forward and back hip for each of the four legs. It says uh, cur in here. This is just short for the current angle of the joint. So this is the angle sensor or the proprioceptive sensor. We've seen this type of sensor with different names throughout this course. Basically, uh, at every time step in the simulation, they get the 12 angles of the 12 joints and plug that in to the sensor layer. Yeah. They then have four touch sensors, one in each of the four feet, and they have four additional uh, sensors which report the pitch, the roll, and the yaw of the main body of the robot. And finally, the 16th sensor neuron or input net neuron is outputting just a sinusoidal pattern. Where have we seen that before? I've seen it a couple times. What is this neuron representing? The central, part of the central pattern generator, right? Maybe just a regular sinusoidal oscillatory pattern is useful for locomotion. Probably it is, yeah? So we've got these 16 sensor neurons, and they are sending out synapses that connect to uh, each of the 16 sensor neurons sends out 25 synapses that connect to the five times four uh, hidden neurons. And then each of the 25 hidden neurons sends out three times four, sends out 12 outgoing synapses that connect to each of the 12 motor neurons. And you can see that each of the 12 motor neurons is labeled with next. Next what, do you think? I'm not super happy with the labeling in here, but you can probably guess what they mean. The next target angle. The next target angle, right? So the, as in your code, what's arriving at these 12 motor neurons is interpreted by the motors as desired angle. Where should, what should the angle be next time step? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, the synapses are not drawn here, but you can, Im you can sort of uh, imagine them. We've got neurons embedded in three-dimensional space and synapses embedded in uh, three-dimensional space as well. We now have a CPPN, and that single CPPN is going to paint a whole bunch of weights onto all of these synapses. Tell me about that CPPN. What does it need? 
If you needed to code up the CPPN, what does it need? So at the board last time we were painting amount of green or we were painting notes onto an empty piece of sheet music. Now we're painting weights onto synapses embedded in three dimensional space. What kind of CPPN do we need to do that? It needs co it needs coordinates exactly. What coordinates? Or the coordinates of what? Do you have an idea? Yep, locations of what? Yes. Uh, exactly, right? We need the location, the coordinates of each synapse. So let's draw this CPPN. It's in three dimensional space. So we need X, Y, Z, and this feeds into whatever our CPPN looks like. Who knows what it looks like? And the value arriving at the single output neuron is the weight. Whatever floating point value arrives here when we plug in the x, y, and z coordinate of, for example, the synapse that connects the pitch set, uh, sensor neuron to this hidden neuron, the x, y, z coordinate of this synapse, the value that comes out, that's the weight of this synapse. We take the same CPPN, we, go, we take the XYZ coordinate of another synapse in the same neural controller, paint a weight onto it, paint, 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 and our single CPPN has constructed a neural controller for the simulated robot. Question? With these three coordinates, if they hypothetically point at one of these circles, how is it differentiating which synapse the pitch is pointing to? Good observation, right? So we're working in three-dimensional space here, so it seems intuitive that our CPPN would need an X, Y, and Z, but what, what exactly is the X, Y, and Z coordinate of a synapse? It's clear what the X, Y, and Z coordinate of a neuron is, because a neuron is basically a point. It's just sitting somewhere in 3D space, but a synapse is an arrow that goes from this X, Y, Z position to this X, Y, Z position. So what is the position, or what is, what, how do we get the X, Y, Z from a synapse that's extended in three-dimensional space? You take the, the midpoint. Let's take the midpoint, for example. Seems like an obvious thing. So we've got our synapse sitting in three-dimensional space, and we're gonna visit the midpoint of every synapse, take the X, Y, Z coordinate of the midpoint, plug it in, and whatever value we get back, that's the weight of the synapse. Seems intuitive and obvious. I think you mentioned already there's a bit of a problem with this. Yep? Yeah, the way this is arranged, um, if you look at like the two, like the top two neurons on the left and take the, um, do our synapse between those and the um, top two on the next layer, so like cross them, it's the same midpoint. Exactly, right? So if you look at this carefully, you'll notice that several synapses cross at their midpoint. If we're encoding, the, if we're gonna use the midpoints of synapses to label their weights, what's gonna happen? Or what, what are we constraining the CPPN to do? Assign the same value to both points. Absolutely, so whatever the CPPN does, it's gonna assign the same weight to both crossed synapses. Okay, so we've got a bit of an issue here. What are we gonna do? Could you just basically make it like a six dimensional input to the CPPN? That was your idea as well? Okay, excellent. So what they did in this experiment is the neural network is embedded in three dimensions, but they're gonna paint patterns in six dimensions, yeah? They are basically elevating the synapses, which exist in three-dimensional space, and they re-embed them in a higher dimensional space. If you take the starting position of each synapse and the ending position of each synapse, or we can say the same thing differently, if we take the position of the presynaptic neuron for that 
synapse, so where the synapse originates, and we take the three-dimensional position of the postsynaptic neuron, where the synapse ends, you can now embed uh, these synapses in six-dimensional space, where every synapse, even if they cross in three-dimensional space, they now have unique addresses in six-dimensional space. Everybody see that? So it seems like an added complication, a, a one that causes a big headache, because now we've got to think in six-dimensional space. But there's a very good reason for it. If they did all of this in three-dimensional space, they're tying the hands of the evolutionary algorithm. It has to assign same weights to crossed synapses. It may be that there are good solutions in this lower dimensional space, they just didn't want to risk it, so they added this additional twist. Yeah? Okay, let's put all these things together. So in this experiment, they're using this particular type of evolutionary algorithm to evolve populations of neural networks. Each one of those neural networks in that population, each, PP, each CPPN, paints a pattern into six-dimensional space. The result of that is they get synaptic weights for all of the, they get weights for all of the synapses in the second neural network, which exists in three-dimensional space. Now that they have a, a fully labeled neural network, they can see how well it produces the desired behavior in the simulated robot and assign the distance traveled by the robot back to the original CPPN. Do that for every CPPN in the initial random population. Delete the CPPNs that produce relatively low fitness and make randomly modified copies using NEAT of the surviving neural networks and keep going. Yeah? Question? How much like longer does that whole generate the CPPN painted on the neural? Like how long does that take? Yep. Time cost wise. Great question. So how long does this take? There's definitely, this is probably the most algorithmically complex experiment we're going to see in this course, right? What's the time cost, do you think, to do all these operations? How much time do you think it takes compared to running the simulation of the, of the robot itself? Probably not a lot, right? So whatever this is, it's probably milliseconds or picoseconds. And on your laptop and on their high-end desktop in 2009, it probably took 30 seconds, 40 seconds to run the simulation, which means one of the nice things about evolutionary algorithms, you don't need to worry about how long it takes, the big O notation, all that for doing all this stuff, throw it out the window. The, the time hog here is the physics engine. Always has been, maybe always will be, who knows, yeah? Doesn't matter. The place where you want to make improvements if you want this to run faster is the simulation. That's the place to make improvements, yeah? Okay, good question though. Okay, so uh, we already kind of answered this question. So why go to all this algorithmic complexity if we could just have used NEAT directly to just evolve sets of synaptic weights? No CPPNs? The answer is that as we saw last time when we looked at hyperneat, it biases evolution to produce regular patterns. The set of synaptic weights inside the CPPN, those weights usually show no regular pattern. We made some CPPNs at the board last time, and although I picked ones and zeros, they were sort of arbitrary numbers, but they produced non-arbitrary non patterns in space and time. Yeah? So when we're, gonna, when we're running this algorithm now, it's going to produce sets of synaptic weights where the set of weights on the left side of this neural network look like the set of weights on the right side of this neural network. We might get regular gradations in the amount of weight as we move from the front of the neural network to the back, or as we move from the right to the left. Evolution is playing with how to combine all these different forms of regularity to produce the desired behavior. Okay. Some of you, maybe, some of you are thinking about, again, us. One of the nice things about evolutionary robotics is it's a bit of a mirror for us to think about the nature of animal and human intelligence. 
If we were to put you in an fMRI machine or crack you open and look at the strength of connections between your neurons, what do you think we would see? That's the hypothesis, that there's regular patterns. Our machines are not detailed enough to be, are, are not strongly observant enough yet to know. What we do know is that in nervous systems, and specifically in mammals and humans, most of the connections are inhibitory. I think I mentioned this earlier, right? I don't know about you, but a day rarely goes by where I have a certain thought about something I want to do or an email I want to send, and I inhibit myself and don't say or don't send that email, right? One of the building blocks of, uh, of intelligence is knowing when not to act, right? Sometimes it takes a lot of strength of will to inhibit a desired action, you know? Whether there is regular patterning in the strength of connections among neurons in uh, biological brains, it's not quite clear yet. The suggestion would be probably yes, but we'll see, we'll see. Okay, so back to robots. So I just described hyperneat here, and the investigators in this experiment performed an A-B test. This is variant A. And they created variant B, which is called FT-NEAT, which stands for Fixed Topology NEAT. So topology, remember, is a synonym for cognitive architecture, the number of neurons and synapses. So they're going to take NEAT, and they're going to evolve populations not of CPPNs. They're going to evolve populations of these guys, which have a fixed topology. There's a certain number of neurons and a certain and the ways in which those neurons are wired up. They're not going to change that. NEAT is just going to evolve changes in the synaptic weights. That's variant B. You know? And they're going to ask the question, which of these two evolutionary algorithms produces faster locomotion or more displacement during the fixed time period? If hyperneat produces faster gates, what does that mean? What can you conclu conclude about why hyperneat evolved faster gates? There can only be one explanation. There's only one difference between A and B here. Patterns are useful, right? So if re regular patterns of synaptic weights across the network is useful, hyperneat should produce faster moving robots. Okay, let's have a look at some video evidence first. So this is anecdotal first. What you're gonna look at here is an evolved one of these networks controlling this robot. It's the most fit neural network found by FTNEAT. They did a whole bunch of runs of FTNEAT, and among all of those runs, they took the high, most fit neural network, took it and put it back in the simulated robot and got this. Hopefully, they got this. I don't have to act this out for you. I've got Wi Fi. There we go. How are we doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. I may not be able to show this to you again. OK, that was the best they were able to get with FTNEAT. Hopefully, I can play this one.
Okay, we might have to come back to this. What I would have shown you in this video, maybe I can in a minute or two, this is the worst evolved gait from variant A, from hypernee. So they tried to be particularly hard on variant A. They did a whole bunch of runs of hyperneat. And among all those runs, they took the one that produced at the end the worst gait, the slowest, basically the worst of the best. You do a whole bunch of runs of hyperneat. You take the best neural network from each of those hyperneat runs. And among those champions, you take the one with the lowest fitness. And OK, if you could see this video, and you can see it, I guess, in the slide deck after, it has a much more regular gait than you just saw. If I remember correctly, this one actually prongs. All four legs happen to move together. So hyper, here, though, that's the anecdotal evidence, or would have been the anecdotal evidence. Here's the actual data. So here's fitness curves that we've seen before. They ran both evolutionary algorithms for 1,000 generations, and they did multiple runs of uh, A up here in purple and B down here in red. And you can see that after 1,000 generations, uh, the robots evolved using hyperneat were traveling at least seven body lengths. FT neat, not, not even half as good. So whatever these regular patterns of synaptic weights are inside the neural network, it helps to produce regular patterns of motion or makes it easier for evolution to evolve regular patterns of motion. Yeah? Okay. As you can tell, hyperneat is a little bit complicated. Um, for those of you that are pretty confident in your coding abilities, you can try tackling hyperneat for a final project. Um, it's not trivial, but it's, it's doable. Okay. So here's a, a visualization, thankfully, of what uh, the data coming from those two videos. Here's uh, pronking for hyperneat. So if you look carefully, hopefully you can see in each of these four panels, there are four different curves corresponding to the angles of, I think it's the four hip joints. Uh, I think it's the four hip uh, joints. You can see here all four are moving together uh, for hyperneat. And here you can also see there's a regular pattern, much less of a regular oscillation in the case when FTNeat was used. Okay. All right, let's look a little bit more about what's actually going on during evolution. Let's look at this plot uh, over here. We're looking again at evolutionary time on the horizontal axis here. So this is the number of generations. And every, uh, every dot in this picture corresponds to a parent-child pair. Remember that in uh, hyperneat and in FTNeat, we're evolving populations of neural networks. We're looking here at every neural network that survived and produced an offspring. That offspring might not have survived into the next generation, but we're taking every parent-child pair, we're, we're taking the fitness of the parent and the fitness of the child and comparing them. The point has a negative Y value if the parent, if the child had a lower fitness than the parent, and the point is above the y equals zero line if that, if that parent had a higher, sorry, if the child had a higher fitness than the parent. So everything above y equals zero here, these were beneficial mutations. Whatever change was made as the parent was producing the child, that change caused the child to cause the robot to move faster. These are uh, detrimental mutations. Whatever change was made, it caused the child to move slower than the parent. Make sense? They did the same thing in all the evolving populations when we weren't evolving CPPNs, we were just evolving NEAT. What can you tell me about how mutation was affected in these two different evolutionary algorithms? Hyperneat. 
there's a lot more, not more mutation. The mutation rate is the same in both. It's more mutation magnitude. The impact of the mutation on phenotype, what the robot eventually does, is bigger. Yeah? Mutations, cause, mutations to CPPNs cause bigger impacts on behavior than mutations to the neural controller directly. Why do you think that's so? Because when you mutate your CPPN, you completely change every single thing. Absolutely. Change every single little bit that's an independent half of your pancreas instead of just changing one neuron that's in your pancreas. Exactly. A mutation, a mutation to this network probably changes the, by definition, probably changes the weight of one synapse, like in your code base. You make a change to one synapse in a CPPN, and it can change the values of all the synapses that it paints weights onto. Yeah? Usually, that sounds like a bad thing, right? We have an evolutionary algorithm now that's making random changes with a sledgehammer rather than a set of tweezers. Yet, hyperneat tends to produce, or does produce, evolve better solutions. How is that possible? The answer to that question is also hidden in these two panels. You can discard all the bad ones, but the fact that the hyperneat creates some really, really, really good ones means those are the ones that are actually surviving onto the next generation. You can also take the really, really good ones, chances are you're going to evolve to the worst ones off of that because you already have a pretty good solution. So even though there's a bunch of you know, much worse ones, the fact that there are so many very, very good ones would suggest that you're still making progress. Absolutely, right? So the key here is in the upper left part of this panel. Even though Hyperneat is a sledgehammer, it's a very, very smart sledgehammer, right? It's making global changes to the neural controller of the robot, but a lot of those global changes end up being good global changes, right? If, for example, we have a partly evolved CPPN that is painting weights that produce pronking in the robot, and a mutation hits a CPPN, which changes the regularity inside the, the neural controller, it can just speed up pronking. Not break pronking, but speed it up or slow it down. It's making, in many cases, good global changes. This is everything, right? This is, this is what matters. As was mentioned, what happens in the case of a deleterious mutation, sorry, I said detrimental before, deleterious mutation, if it's bad, it doesn't matter how bad it is, that child's probably destined for the trash heap of history, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. You'll notice also that there's a, 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 a broad range of positive effects, small ones and big ones. If you remember all the way back to our discussion about evolutionary algorithms, you can get trapped in a local optima, right? You're in a valley and you can't climb out. You take a small step in any direction and you're stuck in this bowl, you can't get out. Unless, what? Sledgehammer. The sledgehammer, you can take a big step, right? You get out of the bowl and onto the slope of an even, uh, uh, that probably leads up to another local optima, another valley, but you can take maybe some small steps or possibly a big step and out you go. Right? If you can only take small steps upward in the fitness landscape, much easier to get stuck. Yeah? Okay. Uh, Hyperneat from 2009 until today is still probably the gold standard for evolving behaviors for this reason. Yeah? Questions? All good? Is that just for like locomotion, or is it also good at evolving like non-locomotion? Good for locomotion. Uh, we've looked at object manipulation. A couple other things. Be great for some of you to tackle hyperneat and try this for jumping, climbing stairs, uh, you name it. Uh, teamwork, coordinated behavior. We don't know yet. Give it a try. Okay. Remember what you're seeing, the data that you're seeing here, this is just for mutation. One parent produces one child. Let's finish this lecture, finally, 
with crossover. Remember back to what NEAT does. NEAT can take two parent neural networks, cut them in a very uh, specific way, glue the parts together to produce one child neural network. So now I want you to think about triples, two parents and one child. We can ask the following question. If we have the fitness for the two parents and the child, is the child's fitness lower than both parents, shown in this picture, uh, but in this picture by the green curves? Is the fitness of the child better than both parents? That's the curve shown uh, in purple here. Or is the fitness of the child between the fitness of the two parents? One, one parent is less fit than the child. The other parent is more fit than that child. Yeah. We have algorithm A here, hyperneat, and our algorithm variant B here, neat. Both have neat in the name, which means both of them are running the neat algorithm. Both of them are combining bits of neural networks together. In the case of the hyperneat algorithm, it's gluing together parts of CPPNs. In the other algorithm, it's gluing together parts of the neural network controller itself. Yeah? And again, we can then ask for all these sexual recombination events that occur over evolutionary time, how often, what fraction of those recombination events produce a child that's more fit than both parents, less fit than both parents, or in between? What happened? Maybe a little bit difficult to see from the back of the room. All the dashed lines are for fixed topology neat. All the solid lines are for hyperneat. What's happening here? What can you conclude from this data? Several things you can conclude here. You'll notice that both orange lines are above the purple and green lines. What does that mean? Most children are participating in the trial. What's that? Most children, both algorithms have participated in the trial. Most, most children look like their parents. They produce similar phenotype. That's what NEAT was kind of designed to do in the first place. We can, we, we NEAT can cut neural networks and glue them together and not break things. It can cut a PC and a Mac in half and glue the two halves together. It seems miraculous, but it works. You can produce something that actually works. Yeah? Uh, you'll notice in the case of hyperneat here, if we look at uh, the solid purple here, the solid purple, this is for hyperneat. These children, the solid purple line, they had fitness that was better than both parents. Uh, FT neat, you can see that's also true. So they're both kind of doing similar uh, things here that recombination is helpful. There is a not inconsiderable period of time, or sorry, there's several times in which the recombination event produces children that are better than both parents. Yeah? This actually helps both algorithms here. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we will stop there and we will see how much of a dent we can make in lecture 15, uh, in lecture 15. Okay, we are switching now to a different challenge in the challenge module. This is probably the biggest open challenge in the field, and I know there's one person here who is trying to cross this gap uh, for a particular technology, which we'll talk about towards the end of the semester. Not an easy gap to cross. We are going to look at one, two, three, four, five different projects that have attempted to cross the gap. Some have been more successful than others. And we're going to look at these five experiments uh, chronologically. The first one dates back to the beginning of evolutionary robotics, the late 90s, uh, and robots that can adapt like animals. I think this was 20, 2015, 2016. So, Still going, yeah? 
Okay, so we'll start with looking at the very first attempt to cross the simulation to reality, uh, simulation to reality gap. As I promised, this was a project that was reported on in 1997, so at the very beginning of evolutionary robotics. Um, what's old is new again. In uh, 2018, uh, the NVIDIA Corporation announced to great fanfare this brand new algorithm they'd come up with called domain randomization. Uh, for those of us that were working in evolutionary robotics, we took deep offense because as you'll see in a moment, this is just a repackaging of something that was reported in the literature over 20 years ago, just given better graphics. In my uh, biased opinion. Okay, what's going on in domain randomization and the radical envelope of noise uh, experiment? You can see it in this picture. In this case, NVIDIA, NVIDIA used their NVIDIA hardware to simulate this particular two-armed robot. Might be hard to see from this picture. It's playing the object in a, pe in a whole game. So this blue object here has a hole in it, and the arm is dangling an object on a string, and it is trying to get that uh, object to pass through the aperture. Yeah, little kids play this game all the time. So they're going to train this robot for this object manipulation task. If you squint very carefully, you'll notice that all the blue boxes are slightly different sized. The yellow object that they're trying to dangle into the aperture also has different sizes and shapes. So they're simulating this robot and its task environment many, many times. And when they do, they always simulate it slightly differently. They add a little bit of noise to various aspects of the simulation. At the beginning of this course, I mentioned that the Greek philosopher Heraclitus over 2,000 years ago is reported to have said, man never enters the same river twice. Yeah? Probably another very basic building block of intelligence is not being able to do just one thing well, but being able to do it under slightly different circumstances, uh, uh, under slightly different circumstances, yeah? So how do we evolve or train a robot to do that? Expose it to lots of different random variants of whatever we want it to do, yeah? Kind of an intuitive idea when you think about it, yeah? It wasn't dreamed up in 2018, it was dreamed up at least by 1997. Okay, so uh, this paper uh, starts out with the following observation. Um, if, if you evolve something in simulation or you, uh, you use an evolutionary algorithm to create controllers, they will evolve to exploit the simulation. Some of you may have noticed this already in your own evolutionary experiments. If those details in the simulator don't exist in reality, the controller will fail to cross the reality gap. Evolution is exploiting things in simulation that don't exist in reality. You are all experts now in physics engines. What might be some of those things that are inaccurate in physics engines that don't exist in the real world that evolution might make use of? When things kind of overlap with each other? When things overlap with one another? Yep. pushes them apart, things don't tend to overlap. Absolutely. Remember our discussion about collision detection and resolution? If two objects partly collide, the simulator will add energy into the system. It'll add forces to push those objects apart. You may not have noticed it yet, but in a lot of cases, your evolutionary algorithm will exploit that and kind of channel that energy into displacement. Other examples? There's tons of them. Some more obvious than others. Different surfaces. Absolutely. So the floor in Pi Bullet has a certain friction coefficient. I can't remember if it's high like carpet or low like ice, but whatever it is, if you were to build a physical version of your robot and put it on something, the friction coefficient of that surface is probably going to be different than the friction coefficient in simulation. If your, if your robot evolves to exploit that, for example, low friction and evolves a robot that skates, and then you put it on physical carpet, obviously that ain't gonna cut it. You're not gonna cross the gap. Other examples. Yeah. 
you've mostly been working with a robot in 3D, but you can make a robot that's mostly two-dimensional. And if there's no noise in the simulation, it can move without falling down. In reality, if you try and be a 2D creature, you're going to have to at least balance or fall one way or the other. Right? Lots of temptations for the evolutionary algorithm to exploit things that aren't real or won't be real if your evolved machines are transferred to reality. Yeah? So how do we sort of poison the well? How do we get the evolutionary algorithm to not want to try and exploit details? The easiest way is to sprinkle some poison, sprinkle some noise. Every time the robot goes to grab an object or move along a surface, the friction coefficient of the floor is always slightly different. It's hit an icy patch, and then it hits a patch of carpet, then ice, then carpet, 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 ice, carpet, and so on. It's gonna to have to evolve a gate that works equally well for carpet and ice. If you then build the robot and put it on something that is neither carpet or ice, it's more likely to work because it's evolved a gate that is relatively robust to surface properties. Make sense? Okay, pretty, pretty intuitive, right? The trick here, though, is where do we add noise? What does it mean to add it in the right way? If we put no noise in the simulation, which is what you all have now, I can guarantee you if you try to build a physical version of your robot out of Lego Mindstorms, it's not going to work because there's noise here in the real world. If you made things super noisy in your simulation, you put noise on everything, what do you think, how would evolution react? I don't think it would evolve. It's just evolution would sort of put up its hands and say, I can't evolve any forward locomotion. The body's always different. I'm on ice, now I'm on carpet. Gravity is shifting. I'm getting hit with objects. There's wind. It's too much. I can't evolve anything for you. The fitness landscape is flat and low. It can't find any good solutions. So where's the Goldilocks zone? Where, where and how do we add noise in the right way so things are just hard enough for the evolutionary algorithm? One way to start, asking, uh, start answering this question is to ask more specific questions like, which parts of the simulation should I noisify? If the simulation is complicated, like the simulator you're using, there's lots of uh, candidate uh, targets, candidate targets. We just mentioned friction, the mass distribution of the body of the robot, its geometry, the properties of the joints, you can play around with that, sensor properties, motor properties, maybe the neurons and the synapses themselves, you can make a little bit, uh, you can make them kind of noisy. It's hard to know. So way back in 1997, they created a minimal simulation that contains as little details about reality as possible. This seems kind of counterintuitive. You would think you want to make a very complex simulation that's as close to reality as possible and then noisify it. The authors in this paper go in the opposite direction. Let's just make things really, really simple. You may remember that I mentioned that physics engines weren't even invented until 2000. So this is three years before physics engines were even invented. There were simpler sort of non-physical simulators at the time. This investigator made a simulation that was even simpler than that. The simulator, as we'll see on the next slide, and we'll see next time, is a spreadsheet. Kind of odd. Okay, I think this is a good place to pause for today. You have a quiz due tonight. Undergraduates, you're starting to think about your final project. Graduate students, you're carrying on with weekly deliverables. Have a good rest of your day. See you on Thursday. <laughs>